Well, good morning and welcome to our worship gathering at Evergreen Baptist Church. I'm Mark Whittington, the pastor, and I want you to know that you are welcome here and a very special part of our church family. Thank you for joining us this morning. Uh, Whether you're a part of our church family on a regular basis or you are worshiping with us as a guest today for the first time or maybe you have been worshiping with us along the way like this for the last several weeks and months, thank you again for joining us, for being a very important, very special part of our church family. We'd love to know that you are joining us from a distance and you can do that uh, most quickly by going to our website, ebcinchrist.org slash connect. You can fill out that connect card and submit that and we'll get that immediately and that lets us know not only that you were with us but also gives you the opportunity to connect with us in any special way that you might uh, need uh, some information or some special ministry or help that we can give to you or someone that you know about or even just a prayer request or something of that nature that you would like to share with us very personally and it will be treated as such. So you please uh, feel free to do that uh, as soon as you can and as soon as you can, if at all possible, we would love to have you to worship with us right here. We're gathering on Sunday mornings at 10.30 in the sanctuary and then on Wednesday evenings at 6.30 right here in the sanctuary. Our youth will be meeting in the gymnasium at 6.30 instead of the youth room. Gives them a little bit more room to spread out. They've not met for the last couple of weeks, but they will be resuming their Wednesday night uh, worship and Bible study time this week. So you uh, make sure, if at all possible, you join us to be a part of that time together. But it's good, so good to have you with us today, worshiping, singing, uh, studying God's Word, uh, and even in a way, fellowshipping together. Uh, Thank you so much for being a part of this time. Uh, But before we continue with our worship time, let's go to the Lord together in a word of prayer. Father, thank you so much. For the beautiful day you have blessed us with, in every way, you are the reason uh, that we are here. And it is because of you that we gather in this time uh, to sing, uh, to fellowship, to pray, to give, to study your word. All of this for you because of you, because of Jesus Christ, because of the price that was paid, the sacrifice that was made that opened the way all the way from us to you. Father, thank you for that amazing privilege and opportunity that we have today. And I thank you for each one who has gathered here today, whether close by or from a great distance. Remind us again, Lord, that that is not a barrier, nor is it an obstacle to you. So I pray that that would be the focus of our faith today, and that would be the focus of our worship today. Thank you that we can gather, that we can glorify the name of Jesus, our Savior and Lord. And I pray today that as we sing, as we give, as we pray, as we study your word, all of this together, that it would be a worship that is pleasing to you, Lord, but also that you would draw our hearts and our minds and our very beings close to you to hear and to see and to know where you are working, what you are doing, and how we can be a part of that work right there. Father, thank you for this time, and thank you, Lord, for the reminders daily, moment by moment, of your presence, of your power in our lives. We need that so desperately in these days, Lord, in so many ways, more ways than than we could even remember to list at a time uh, like this, but so many ways, physically, emotionally, uh, politically, uh, socially, more than any, spiritually, we need you. We need your presence. We need your power. We need your peace in our lives and in our land today. And Father, I pray that it would be uh, in us and through us that you are able to do your work by the power of your Holy Spirit. Thank you. Thank you for that today, and thank you for showing us again and again your faithfulness. And Lord, as we worship together this morning, remind us, reassure us, and, and refocus our thoughts and our direction on you. Lord, the greatest example, the clearest example of love and surrendered sacrificial service through your one and only Son, our Lord, our Savior, Jesus Christ. And it's in His name that we pray today. Amen. Amen. 
Well, join with us together as we sing, He Keeps Me Singing, and then a beautiful little chorus, Blessed Be the Name of the Lord. i 
Take your Bible with me and turn to John chapter 13. I hope you have a copy of God's Word close at hand, and you will open it up there to John chapter 13. As we continue our study that we have been in for the last several weeks, going God's way, developing a gospel vision and a ministry mindset today, focusing on the clearest example that we could ever find in the Scriptures of doing just that, Jesus himself, the supreme example of serving others, the supreme example of loving others. And we'll see that in just one of the many places we could look this morning in John chapter 13. Well, over the last uh, month and a half or so, we've looked at several of the Bible's most well-known individuals in an effort to see clear examples of what it looks like, how we should see what we should see in our lives if we are going to go God's way. Uh, Abram, uh, whom God later uh, changed his name to Abraham. Uh, the prophet Elijah, Ruth, 
uh, John the Baptist, Andrew, uh, Simon, uh, whom God, uh, whom Jesus later uh, changed his name to Peter. These are just a handful, just a handful of those representing many, many more that you will discover if you are consistently, daily, intentionally studying God's Word. This is why from, from month to month, from year to year, you need to be, we need to be as individuals and as a church intentionally, daily, consistently studying God's Word because they will literally leap off the page. Well, again, uh, and and then all of these, uh, there's no way in just the short time that we have from Sunday to Sunday uh, to to do a full in-depth point-by-point coverage of these. You might say we're looking at these individuals and and kind of painting with a uh, with a with a broad brush stroke. And uh, my my hope, my desire is that you have and that you will. Go back, look at these, spend some time, camp out in these passages. Take the passage that we're studying on a Sunday and and, and, and jump back into it, Uh, wade back through it uh, every day for the next week. Uh, Look, listen uh, to and watch and see what God is doing. Well, obviously, if we were to say, okay, in one message, we're going to see the example of love and service in, in the life and mission and message of Jesus Christ, uh, that would be, the, uh, that would be the, the, the greatest understatement of the year. Uh, there's no way in just a few moments we can even really adequately begin uh, to plumb the depths uh, of this reality. So what I want us to do is I want us to, even with that broad brush, take one evening, just, just a few hours in Uh, the mission and the message and the ministry of Jesus with his disciples very near the end of his earthly ministry. Where are we going? We are going to a place that might just seem very normal and a mundane custom uh, in the uh, the day uh, that Jesus came and in the day that the scriptures are recorded. And that is the night that Jesus washed the disciples' feet. Why? Why? make such a big deal of this, of this, of this normal, uh, mundane drudgery, if you will, of a custom. Uh, think of it in, the, in similar uh, aspects of in some Asian countries, uh, when you go into a home, you take your shoes off. Now, there are some aspects of honor to that, but as I've read this week, one of the primary reasons, at least through history, uh, that that is done in many of the Asian countries is because uh, they don't have tables and chairs and things like that. When they eat, they, most of what happens in their, in their main family room happens on the floor. So it keeps the floor clean. It's just a practical, primarily, not exclusively, but in many ways, just a practical uh, way to keep the floor clean. Well, this is what, this is what would be done uh, in uh, the first century uh, Palestine, dusty, dirty roads coming in. Uh, no, no, no table and chairs like we have when they reclined. They reclined around on the floor. There were pillows. They were, they were kind of laid back, maybe propped on one arm, maybe even propped against each other from time to time. So you wanted the floor to be as clean as possible. So it was tradition that when guests would come in, there would be a bowl, there would be water, there would be a servant, and the servant would wash your feet. And we get to John chapter 13, and John records this event in great detail. Why? Why make such a big deal of washing feet? Well, because John obviously makes a big deal of it in his gospel, and ultimately, as we'll read this morning, Jesus makes a big deal out of it. Now, let me just say from the outset, this is not a command simply to go and wash feet. Now, it, it, it's, a, it's a fantastic way, and I've, I've, I've seen it, I've witnessed it in a church setting, uh, and I've actually been a part of it in smaller group settings, and I've actually had the privilege of doing it in, in mission trip settings on our trips to Ecuador, of, of, of doing this act of service 
to others, literally washing feet. And it's one of the most wonderful, amazing, humbling experiences that you will ever have for someone to wash your feet or to be able to do that to someone else. But we need to understand when Jesus, throughout the Gospels, we've said this before, when Jesus gives a physical illustration, it always has a larger, greater, more eternal context and application. And we'll see that this morning. So let's read it. First several verses of John chapter 13. Now before the feast of the Passover, Jesus, knowing that his hour had come, and that he would depart out of this world to the Father, having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end, or to the fullest, or to the utmost. During supper, the devil, having already put into the heart of Judas Iscariot, the son of Simon, to betray him, Jesus, knowing that the Father had given all things into his hand, And that he had come forth from God and was going back to God, got up from supper and laid aside his garments, and taking a towel, he girded himself. Then he poured water into the basin and began to wash the disciples' feet and to wipe them with the towel with which he was girded. Then he came to Simon Peter, and he said to him, Lord, do you wash my feet? Jesus answered and said to him, What I do to you, you do not realize now, but you will understand hereafter. Peter said to him, Never shall you wash my feet. Jesus answered him, If I do not wash you, you have no part with me. Simon Peter said to him, Well, Lord, then don't wash only my feet, but also my hands and my head. Jesus said to him, He who has bathed needs only to wash his feet, but is completely clean. And you are clean, but not all of you. For he knew the one who was betraying him. And for this reason he said, Not all of you are clean. So when he had washed their feet, And taking his garments and reclined at the table again, he said to them, Do you know what I have done to you? You call me teacher and Lord, and you are right, for so I am. If I then, the Lord and the teacher, washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. For I gave you an example that you also should do as I did to you. Truly, truly, I say to you, a slave is not greater than his master, nor is one who is sent greater than the one who sent him. If you know these things, you are blessed if you do them. What is Jesus doing here? He is physically serving them, and he is giving them not only a visual illustration of what their service from here on out will look like. But he is, in essence, I like to think, giving them a preface of the ultimate demonstration that he is about to give them on the cross. He is taking before them literally the position of a slave, of a bondservant, by washing their feet, physically speaking. A very simple, mundane task, but yet... in in a matter of hours, will be hanging on the cross as John had identified him some three or so years ago as the Lamb of God taking away the sin of the world. Remember what we said. Anytime Jesus gives a physical illustration, it always has a heavenly meaning, a heavenly context. And that is what he was doing here. He was giving them the preface of what was to come in just a matter of hours. But he was also giving them physically the example of what their service, what their love, what their ministry was going to have to look like. And ours today too, if we are going to go with God as individuals, if we are going to have a gospel vision and a ministry mindset, then this is the way we are going to have to serve. And sometimes, yes, that might mean washing someone's feet, taking the lowest physical position. Listen, you can't wash someone's feet standing up. You've got to get down. You've got to get low. In fact, you've almost got to get lower than the person that you are washing their feet. If you want to give that a try, listen, as soon as we can, you go to Ecuador with me. And I will, I will give you the privilege. You will have the most amazing privilege to do that to some of the most wonderful, loving, receptive, uh, physically and spiritually needy people that you will ever meet. But you can't stand up and wash somebody's feet. So Jesus was showing them not only physically, but in every way the posture that they would be going forth from here on. Well, what did that service 
What did that love look like in Jesus' life? Well, what, what does he show them here? Let's look at four things really quickly that Jesus shows them here about his love and his service for others. First of all, his love was intentional. His love was intentional. And we see this very clearly in the first three verses or so that we read. Uh, first of all, we see that Jesus knew what time it was. He knew what time it was. Now, that doesn't mean that he had a watch on and he knew what time it was. We, 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 you know, that's something that we all are concerned about in moments like this. I realize that. But that's not the time that I'm talking about. Jesus knew what time it was. John records it. Jesus knew that it was Passover. It was Passover. This was the celebration of Israel's freedom from their bondage in Egypt. Jesus would soon become the perfect final Passover sacrifice. Not just for Israel but for all the world. Jesus knew what time it was. It was no accident, it was no coincidence that all of this was taking place at Passover. He knew, as John writes, that his hour had come. If you read through the Gospels, quite often you will hear Jesus make a statement such as this. Maybe when he tells something to his disciples or even when he performed a miracle, he would say, and now do not tell anyone about this. And the, and the Gospel writer will say, and he said this for his hour had not yet come. What does John write in John 13, 1? Knowing that his hour had come. It was time for everyone to know who Jesus was and why he was here and what he could do. Jesus knew what time it was. And, and he also knew it was time to love them to the end, to love them completely. He said because of this, John writes, that he loved them to the end. What Jesus was about to do, as we already said, was literally a snapshot, a preface of what he was going to do on the cross. That word that the New American Standard translates end could be translated fullest or utmost. He loved them with the, with the most complete love that he could give here and as it carried on to the cross and beyond. Think about this, the picture this way, and, and I don't want to stir emotions that are too deep and too painful in your mind potentially by bringing up uh, a precious memory but but I do want you to think of it of how intense this was for Jesus physically speaking you've heard the question and and occasionally you may have been in a situation with a family member where you experienced this and where someone knew that they only had hours to live and occasionally, you know, the question is asked kind of tongue-in-cheek. Well, if you only had 24 hours to live, what would you do? You know, would you, would you go live it up? You know, would you go find that one person that you knew you needed to reconcile with? Or, you know, would you just, uh, you know, sit and, and watch the sunset? Well, you know, what would you do? Well, that's, 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 what's, that's where Jesus' mind is right here. He knows he only has a few hours left, and John records it very specifically. And in this, why he did, why he made such a big deal out of washing their feet, because this was the way he was going to show them what full, complete, total love looked like from there all the way to the cross. He loved them to the end. Jesus knew what time it was. Secondly, Jesus knew who Judas was. That's how intentional this was. He knew who Judas was. He did. What does it say? During supper in verse 2, the devil having already put into the heart of Judas Iscariot, the son of Simon, to betray him. And then, of course, later down in his commentary to Peter in that conversation, he makes the comment that not all of you are clean. And again, John commentates there because he knew the one who would betray him. He knew who Judas was. Listen, the word put here, and this is one of those things, and I, I, I do not in any way boast to be a Greek scholar. I just have enough tools on my computer where I can find some words that make me sound really smart. But the word put here, where it says the devil put into the heart of Judas, it's not one of those things where it was just kind of like, you know, you see it uh, illustrated in a cartoon where it's just kind of a little mist, you know, and it just kind of comes into his mind. The word put here literally means to throw. I mean, it was as though Satan reared back with all that he had and just crammed it into the heart of Judas, threw it into the heart of Judas. It was forced into the heart of Judas. That moment, he was overcome and possessed 
by the plan of Satan himself. And Jesus knew it. Jesus knew it. And he washed his feet anyway. We'll come back to that, but just hang on to that one. This love was intentional. Jesus knew what time it was. He knew who Judas was. And thirdly, he knew where he was going. He knew where he was going. Verse 3, Jesus knew that the Father had given all these things into his hand, that he had come from the Father, that he was going back to God. What I like to think of here in verse 3 is this. Jesus knew that the cross was not his final stop. He knew that the cross was not his final stop. Therefore, he kept on loving. Listen, Jesus' love for his disciples for his executioners, and for you and me was not an accident. It was intentional. And our love for others must be too. Must be too. Remember I said you can't wash somebody's feet standing up? You can't love someone with the love of Jesus accidentally. It's got to be intentional. Intentional. So, His love was intentional. His example, secondly, we see here in verse 4 that his example was sacrificial. What does it say that he did? He got up from supper. He laid aside his garment, took a towel, and wrapped it around himself. In one swift move, Jesus, who was present from and involved in the creation of the world, God in the flesh, having the power to silence the storm, heal the sick, and even raise the dead, took on the appearance and the posture of a slave. In one move. And Paul draws this in in his word picture so well. In his letter to the Philippians in chapter 2 verse 5. Where Paul urges the Christians at Philippi to have this attitude in yourself. Which was also in Christ Jesus. Who although he existed in the form of God. Did not regard equality with God something to be grasped. But he emptied himself taking the form of a bondservant and being made in the likeness of men, being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. That's why I say what Jesus did here as he washed the disciples' feet was a preface. It was a snapshot that was was showing them what was about to ultimately happen, that ultimate, most complete, eternal demonstration of his love. Listen, this is what sacrificial love is. If we are going to talk about loving others sacrificially, then this is the kind of love it's going to take. It must grip our hearts in every way. It must grip our thoughts. It must grip our actions. Listen, sacrifice is more than just putting a little extra in the offering plate. Sacrifice is more than just going on a mission trip for a week. Sacrifice is more than just giving your off day to go help a neighbor do some uh, repair work on their house. Now, all of these are good. All of these are wonderful. And all of these should be demonstration of our love for one another and our love for Jesus. But if we are going to talk about sacrificial love, we're going to have to talk about Jesus, the creator of the universe, the one who was there when, when the worlds were formed. And the one who not only spoke the worlds into existence, but spoke and Lazarus came out of the dead. The one who, 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 who could have called 10,000 angels to save him from this cruel crucifixion. And he took the form, he took the position, he took the posture of a slave, a servant. Obedient not only to serve, but to die. That's sacrifice. That's sacrifice. Sacrifice equals everything. If if you just want to put it in an equation, that's about the simplest way we can say it. Sacrifice equals everything. And that's what Jesus gave. That's what Jesus gave. His example was sacrificial. This is our model. This is the pattern. Well, 
What do we see in the, in the bulk of the chapter, of course, where he's washing his feet? And obviously Peter takes up a great portion of this, as we've said, as he does quite often through the Gospels. Uh, we see Jesus' method was personal. It was personal. And we've already hit on this. Uh, and again, we're going to paint with very broad uh, brush stroke over this and not spend very much detailed time. But we need to see this because our ministry must be personal. The vision that God will give us to take his gospel to all the world, it will be personal. Our mindset uh, as, 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 in, as followers of Jesus Christ and as part of his body right here in Evergreen, Alabama, must be personal. I've already said you can't wash someone's feet standing up, but you can't wash someone's feet without getting personal. You can't wash someone's feet without getting personal. You can't live out a gospel vision and a ministry mindset without getting personal. So many memories. And I've, you've seen some pictures, and I look forward to the days that we can show you more and that many of you can go and experience the, the most wonderful experience of little children, literally, literally some of them just, just infant children that mothers are holding all the way to 70 and 80-year-old men uh, that, that don't even speak modern Spanish, literally speak the old Quechua Indian language. One, on the first trip uh, that I was able to be a part of, the first mission that I was able to be a part of, uh, shared through uh, the translator, through, through a, a, a friend who spoke Quechua to our translator who spoke Quechua and Spanish and English. So we were literally going through two translators, and he said he had been praying for years for someone to come to his community and show this kind of love. Been praying for years literally the patriarch of the community. And as he walked away, he had to have two small sticks under his arm, two canes to help him walk, so feeble. But yet, thanking God for a love that was personal. You see, and, and the reason I use Ecuador uh, is because uh, of the struggle. Ecuador Religion-wise, Ecuador is not an untouched country. But spiritually speaking, in many ways, Ecuador and a, a large portion of Latin American countries are, especially in the remote areas, are still spiritually dark because the religion they have been taught and the religion they have grown up with is a religion of performance. It's a religion of doing and giving to please God. Not a religion that is personal. Not a religion where God loves you, period. But God loves you if. And that's why it's such a joyful time when they realize that Jesus loves them, that God loves them, period. And they see it through such simple tasks as washing feet and giving of a new pair of boots. It's personal. It's personal. Listen, ironically, this, this task would have normally been done by someone who cared nothing for the people whose feet he was washing. I mean, the slave would have not cared who the person was, wouldn't have, wouldn't have, wouldn't have known the person, wouldn't have ever made eye contact with the person, would have, would have been instructed not to, most likely not to speak, not to acknowledge, but just wash the feet and disappear. That's who would have normally done this task. But this time, it was just the opposite. The one who washed their feet cared personally, intimately, specifically for each and every one of them, even Judas. And I can only imagine what that exchange must have been like. This kind of love, listen, this kind of love was normal for Jesus. He played with the children. He lifted up the sinners out of the dirt. He touched the blind, the leper, and even the dead. This kind of love was, was normal for Jesus. And yet the disciples were still overwhelmed. If we're going to live obediently to the great commandment and the great commission, we cannot do it from a distance. We cannot do it from a distance. We must be ready and willing to go to all the world. Why? Because that's who Jesus loved. That's who Jesus loved when he gave his life. And we see that here 
And obviously in the verses that follow, that the application for all of this, the application, it's universal. The application is universal. What did he say? He said, if I, the Lord your teacher, have washed your feet, you also ought to to wash one another's feet. For I gave you an example that you should do to one another. You might call these verses the preface to the Great Commission. Maybe the preface to the great, because, because you, can read, you, can, you can read that and say, well, it sounds like he's instructing the disciples to wash one another's feet. Yes, he's, he is, the, the, the first instruction he gives them is, is love and serve one another. I think that's a, a very direct command to the church today. The body of Christ, we should be loving and serving one another. Oh, how it breaks my heart to see individuals within a church family angry and bitter and divided against one another. That should not be. That is not of God. That is not of the Holy Spirit. That is Satan working his divisive work just like he did in the heart of Judas on that night. When we see within the church, within the body, division and bitterness and, 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 and prejudice, and preference over overriding the Word of God and the Spirit of God. Should not be. Yes, that was the initial command. He said, yes, love, serve one another. But that was not where his command stopped because we know the Great Commission. Whether you look at it in in Matthew chapter 28, which we're very familiar with, or John chapter 20, John gives us a snapshot of that Great Commission in John chapter 20, verse 21. Jesus said to them again, peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, I also send you. Or as the hymn writer writing, from the King James Version, so send I you. So yeah, the application, it's universal. It's universal. Yes, we need to love Jesus right here, right now in Evergreen Baptist Church. Why? Because Jesus said so. And because this is where we develop a gospel ministry, uh, a gospel vision, and a ministry mindset to do what? To go across town to go across America, to go across the oceans. This is where we develop that gospel vision and that ministry mindset right here. Anywhere, anytime, at any cost, wherever, whenever, to whomever. Now, you may have already thought this, or you may be thinking it now. Me, wash feet? Wash feet? Yes, perhaps. Listen, no one is above serving. No one is above serving. If Jesus humbled himself in this way, it is the least that I can do. No one is above serving. Anybody, anywhere, yes. But we also need to understand this. No one is below being served. Even Judas. You may say, oh, there's no way I'm going to wash. No, there's no way I'm going to go here. There's no way I'm going to for so-and-so. No one is below being served. Jesus, if Jesus is our example, then the application is universal. If Jesus is our source, then we are able. If Jesus is the reason, then we need no other. Heavenly Father, I pray that this would be a very beautiful, very powerful, a very clear picture for us today that would go so much farther than just an event, just an an, an act of kindness. Lord, would you help us to see here in the example of of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, what full, sacrificial, personal, intentional, universal love looks like. Oh, would you let it be, Lord? Would you let it be a reality right here, right now, in our lives, in our church, in our community? Would you let it spread? Oh, would you let it spread? Use us, Lord, for the declaration of your gospel and for your glory. Father, thank you. Thank you for working in us and through us. And thank you for loving us so much 
that you, you meet us where we are and you have loved us and you have served us and you have died for us right where we are with a love so great that we cannot stay where we are. Lord, we, we need to go with you. We need to go with you. And I pray this morning, realizing that that may mean for someone who's watching or listening, that today is the day to take that first step of faith and trust and obedience in you. Coming before you and saying, I'm a sinner. I need a Savior. And today, I turn from from my will and my way in repentance and faith. I turn to Jesus as my Savior and Lord, believing that He is the Son of God, God in the flesh who came and lived a perfect life, died on a cross paying the, the price for my sin that I could not pay, was buried and rose again for the forgiveness of my sin and the promise everlasting life in heaven with you, Lord. Oh, oh, what a joy. But today, today, Lord, would you draw that one to you who not only needs to to admit their sin, to believe in Jesus, but to confess their faith and trust in you. That may be you right here, right now, today, saying, yes, today, I give my all. I give my life. I give my everything to Jesus who gave his all, his life, his everything for me. And today I follow him and I trust him and I place my faith in him as my Savior and Lord. These are the first steps of of being a, a Christian, a follower of Jesus Christ. Maybe that you've made those steps already, but you realize there's so many more steps to make. And you may realize that there are so many more places in your life that you need to come clean. You need to surrender wholly and completely to the Lord today. Would you do that right here, right now? All of me for all of you, Lord. I want to love you with my heart, with my soul, with my mind, with my strength all that I have, all that I am. Lord, thank you for your grace. Thank you for your mercy. Thank you for your perfect love today. And thank you that we see that so clearly through the example, the clear example of Jesus and the challenge to love one another as he has loved us. Lord, let that be the reality in our lives in these days. Guide our path each step of the way. Guard our steps as we serve you all the way home, all the way home. We thank you for that today, Jesus. In your name we pray. Amen. Amen. God bless you for worshiping together with us today. What a joy it is always to to fellowship, to gather together, to worship together with you. And I'm grateful that you've joined us this morning. And I hope you will continue to do that either uh, through uh, this very wonderful way or hopefully very soon in person you will join us on a Sunday morning or a Wednesday evening. And we'll be as the, as the schedule uh, begins to uh, move forward, adding more of our regular worship and Bible study times together as well. So you look forward uh, for that. And we hope to see you real soon. God bless you. We love you so much.